Thanks everyone for having me. Apparently everyone's tired, so I have a, a rather easy one for you to um, go easy into uh, this first evening. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about what changes when we uh, develop for the cloud, uh, when we address cloud-native applications, uh, how, we, how we need to think about our internal architecture and code architecture. Um, quick, very quick words about myself. Um, as, as has been said, I'm CTO and co-founder of Exoscale. We're a, a European-based uh, cloud hosting company. You can check us out upstairs if you want. Uh, I've been in the open source community for quite a while now, initially with uh, OpenBSD, and then later on with um, distributed systems work, uh, and most notably now with um, Riemann and other distributed mo monitoring solutions. Um, I, I actually started this company because very early on I also uh, started developing for, for the cloud, so most of this talk will be sharing what, what we've learned uh, along the years. So before uh, going into it, uh, I took a page from uh, good old Wikipedia uh, and how they define scalability themselves, uh, which is the ability of a system network or process to handle a growing amount of work in a capable manner uh, or its ability to be enlarged to accommodate growth. Uh, and that's something that we'll focus on today. All right, so there are many stories to be told uh, about scalability and as systems and as organizations expand and need to uh, get bigger faster, uh, there are a number of factors that need to be considered. Uh, some are purely human, some are uh, cultural uh, and organizational. Uh, I have a lot of stories to tell about those, uh, but I won't be sharing them uh, today. Today's a, a talk that's focused about the code and architectural aspect of scalability. Uh, so basically technical architecture and, and code infrastructure as well as operations. So I'll go through uh, a number of things. Um, what we mean by scaling and the different ways we can scale, uh, how we did it up until now, uh, what the cloud is bringing to the table, uh, as well as then a few pointers of uh, you know, the quick takeaway things uh, uh, that can work for almost any applications. So here, today I'll be using cloud as you know, a global term. Uh, what I mean by that is cloud hosting, infrastructure as a service, uh, what you really uh, work with on a day-to-day -day basis as developers. Uh, and, and the spectrum from which I look at the problem is uh, people building applications that they wish to publish uh, on the web, uh, because this has become uh, the common approach now. All right. So first of all, um, a few pointers on how we can actually scale things. Um, the first one, the traditional one, I would say, is uh, scaling up, uh, meaning uh, I have a box, uh, I get to buy a bigger box, and uh, things uh, suddenly work well. Um, that's, that's how you typically approach things like databases or, or traditional systems, uh, and really is uh, the easiest way to think about scaling things. The second approach uh, is scaling out, or horizontal scaling, uh, and it's, to, it's the act of adding resources, adding systems to accommodate growth. Right. And that's, that's usually the approach you'll have primarily for uh, stateless things, because there it makes the, the most sense. Uh, you have a load balancer, it has free application servers, there's a peak, you need more uh, capacity, you'll add two servers. And in reality, what we see most often, uh, either from our perspective or from our customers, is to start by scaling up uh, as much as you can and, and then starting to scale out. Because obviously, it's still uh, much more practical and much more convenient to scale without touching anything, which is the vertical approach. So if we look at how people did it up until now, uh, the common approach was to just wait. You would write code, you would hit a, a bottleneck in your code, uh, you could wait, what, six months, uh, a much bigger box would be available at exactly the same price than you bought the old box for, and suddenly everything would run faster. Uh, and when you can still do that, when you can still pile up capacity, that's a great approach. It's still something that actually works very well. So we do feel uh, the imperative to change that uh, now, and, and we do that because uh, this guy is wrong. Um, 
when Moore told us that uh, over the history of computing, the number of transistors on integrated circuits would double approximately every two years, that's not quite as true today as it used to be. Uh, the, the most, um, uh, how would I say, daring example is your laptop. Uh, if, you, if you look at your laptop today and the laptop that you had three years ago, there isn't much change. Maybe, maybe you get a bigger, a better screen. If you have a Mac, maybe you have a keyboard that's not as good as three years ago, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's pretty much the same machine, the same chipset, the same amount of RAM. Uh, what did change in, in plenty of systems is the ability to stuff uh, many more cores in a single machine uh, than previously. Uh, but as soon as you add cores to machine, you introduce a, a new problem. Uh, you have to start using threads, like your application can't, go, uh, can't be a purely imperative uh, solution that uh, goes from, uh, from beginning to end. And some programming languages uh, give us good tooling to work with threads. Uh, Java is a good example, but getting uh, concurrency and thread safety um, right in Java um, you know, gave the opportunity to many people to write very, very long books. Uh, and if you look at other programming languages, their, their approach to threading is, uh, how would I say, um, not as... Um, not as complex uh, and requires to spin up many, many processes. Um, the direct um, implication of this is that you can't just use a vertical approach to scaling anymore for these types of, um, of solutions. Um, but meanwhile, what people have, have been working on is um, advanced virtualization. Uh, we now have uh, very good hardware virtualization support in processors uh, that, give basic, that give you basically um, bare metal machines uh, even when virtualized. <clears throat> so the next logical step was to try and uh, enclose that uh, in programming languages and give ways to, to, to program around um, actual computing resources, which is where uh, cloud hosting came, comes from. So, very quickly, um, you know, you all know cloud hosting. It's IT as a utility. It gives you programmable resources that you can access either from your programming languages or from um, automation tooling. Uh, it uh, completely decouples uh, resources from uh, from where they actually uh, are reified. Uh, and the added bonus is that you only pay for what you use on people that are serious about it. Um, so plenty of upsides, um, and you know I have a vested interest in telling you that there are plenty of upsides. So take all of this with a grain of salt. Uh, but you basically stop doing any capacity planning. Uh, that's something that uh, cloud hosters are here to do for you. Um, the fact that you shift from uh, large uh, capital expenditures to purely operational expenditure is also something that's very convenient to, especially when you can factor in the price of infrastructure uh, in your application. Uh, and I, don't, I haven't met anyone uh, that really likes to wake up at 3 a.m. to go change a desk. The key, the key message, though, is that a lot of complexity also goes away uh, when, you try to, when you start to consume resources from uh, uh, cloud hosting companies. You don't really have to deal with switches. You don't have to think about complex uh, data center structures. Uh, where should I put what network? Uh, where should I allocate which IP? This is, this is all something that's given to you now. Uh, you don't even have to deal with uh, you know, purely systems things like uh, dealing with uh, hardware RAID or uh, things like this. What you do is that you use a simple interface, uh, but mo what most people do is that they actually um, describe the infrastructure they want to reify in code directly. All right, but I mean, uh, nothing's perfect. Um, there's this famous saying that uh, there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. Uh, I think that's really true, uh, but the key thing that you should remember is that uh, it's, it's someone else's uh, pager as well. Uh, so you won't get bothered with, uh, um, you know, purely dumb problems. The, th the key thing that's harder is, 
is that it's hard to take all the knowledge that, especially from, from operations people that uh, you might work with, it's hard to take that knowledge that you have built over time about uh, VLANs, about switches, switches about network configuration, uh, and, and do away with that. Uh, stop thinking in terms of boxes, but in terms of programmable uh, resources. It's also hard to trust someone else to run your things. Uh, you used to be able to walk in into the data center and actually t touch the boxes. That's something that's not true anymore in that world. Uh, and uh, there is also a limit uh, in terms of how high you can scale. Uh, it, it, it all runs on actual hardware uh, if, you, if you look under the covers. So uh, there's a limit to how much RAM you can put on a virtual machine as well. And the last thing and the hardest things uh, which I'm here to talk about is, is that it also forces you uh, into a more horizontal approach uh, in terms of infrastructure. All right. So what does that mean in practice? What are the key drivers uh, that help reduce complexity? Uh, I'll go through a few. Uh, through a few. There, there are also um, other things uh, that w we could talk about. The first thing that I think is uh, key is that services should be inspectable, right? Uh, if when you build systems which have a lot of volatility, uh, where nodes could uh, come in and go, you need to give yourself tools to understand how the the application lives. Um, and that means building external introspection, uh, going through standard monitoring procedures, but also building introspection directly into the application. Uh, let's say that you have a system uh, that uh, consumes data off of a queue uh, and that then performs actions. You will want to um, uh, know how many uh, requests you've acknowledged, uh, how many have failed to have a good way to report uh, errors. Uh, and to time action to quickly identify where you might be spending most of your time. You also want to avoid uh, spending too many resources doing uh, that instead of the actual work. Uh, so what you want is very small probes. Uh, there are a number of tools that work with UDP that can uh, let you send very small signals uh, and that will give you feedback on how, how things are going. Uh, there are a number of tools that already exist that help you build um, these things in your application. Uh, Prometheus is the cool kid around the block now. Uh, Riemann is a great system for it. Uh, StatsD is much more simple, but it can also be leveraged in almost any application. Uh, and there are a number of uh, corollary products just like, such as CollegeD and SyslogNG, which can also step in to uh, ease your life here. Um, yeah, and in terms of code, that can actually be quite simple. That can end up being very unobtrusive uh, code inside your applications and give you a lot of value. I also think that uh, structural logging uh, is something that uh, really helps uh, dig very deep in, uh, in applications. Uh, the fact that when you emit uh, that an error happens, you also... You also uh, add to the, the log message the fact that it was for a specific account, uh, that the action, uh, in, that the API request that you had was a, a 403, uh, things like these, uh, very small details that can help you then uh, look at your structured logs from something like Kibana uh, will greatly help. One of the key things I always try to, to explain is uh, how much you should favor queues over RPC when designing uh, complex systems, especially in microservice uh, architectures, uh, how much queues will save your life, uh, generally speaking. And, 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 and that strong belief becomes from, uh, comes from the fact that RPCs, what, what they do is that they couple systems together. Uh, and the whole availability of a single system uh, that consumes from, RPC, from external RPC uh, providers um, will be defined by the weakest uh, in the whole chain in terms of um, availability um, compromises that they make. Uh, if you wait for an external, if every request that comes in reaches out to an external API that's only available 60% uh, of the time and you don't have anything to, um, uh, to handle failures, that's, that's going to be your, uh, your system's uh, properties. A, 
a good page can be taken out of, out of the, the old systems. Uh, if you look at SMTP, for all its flaws and all the spam that it sends everyone, uh, SMTP is a great system in the sense that it got um, the notion of responsibility uh, completely right. As soon as someone says, OK, I'm now responsible for that email, uh, any sending system now uh, can be free of that responsibility. So it's a textbook example of how queues help um, you know, maintain very good uh, availability promises. Queues almost also promote statelessness. You don't need to reach out to a, a, a data system every time you step from uh, a, a system to, to another. Uh, and I think that's also uh, something that uh, will help. And the key thing that you will, um, you will be able to do as soon as you start uh, queuing is have the ability to look at how much backlog you have and how much extra capacity you need to be able to serve a specific workload. Uh, and there is a very easy answer to um, uh, having too much backlog. Uh, you just spin up new workers. All right. Graceful degradation is uh, an obvious approach uh, also that um, when you have to use RPC, you should be able to handle uh, um, failures in your RPC systems uh, well. Uh, maybe you have a specific SQL database that can go down. Uh, and if you have a specific system that, that goes down, maybe you, you stop accepting new user registrations, but you still serve your main workload. Uh, that's easy to say. Uh, more often than not, it's a bit harder to put in practice, uh, but that's something that uh, should be taken into account when designing systems. Again, here, to avoid the failure propagation, uh, using queues as a back, pre back pressure mechanism is really something that uh, will find, uh, find its way into systems and make things much easier. Um, there are out there um, a number of examples in terms of available libraries which makes things, um, which ease your life when designing systems that can handle failure. Um, typically, I think uh, Finagle um, is, a, is a set of libraries that really help you design uh, re resilient systems in the sense that connection pooling, retry policies are things that are uh, already given out to you. Um, in, in the more recent world, uh, things like gRPC from Google also will, uh, will help design systems that have good properties, uh, even though they favor RPC. Yeah, again, as, as much as possible, uh, trying to work around uh, transient, transient failures by only disabling a subset of functionality is something that uh, I think should be the go-to approach. Last bit of advice would be to try and, and, and really think about what properties each component that you choose uh, provides. Um, when you build systems, it's easy to think about the compromises you're making when you're building your own code. But when choosing a database, it's sometimes a bit more abstract to understand what notion you're going to be working with, to understand what a SQL server gets you and what it won't get you, what Redis will get you and what it won't, uh, you also have to think about that because every, every one of these components that you add will also impact uh, the availability of your app down the line. So, as I was saying, you're probably going to want a queuing system. Uh, if you could avoid using MySQL as one, you, you'd be better off, even from the, from the get-go. Uh, it's, it's, it's a choice that a lot of people make in the beginning that comes biting uh, in the end. Uh, I think that systems like Apache Kafka now are much more easy to operate than they once were. Uh, and sometimes, if you have a small workload, you could even start with Redis as a queuing system. Um, it won't be great, but switching from that to something like RabbitMQ or Kafka will be much easier than uh, trying to stick with SQL down the line. Caching as much as possible, I would advise for doing locally, uh, in, in the sense that you should try and avoid a huge central uh, Redis or memcached instance uh, that will get hammered by every system that you have. Uh, and basically tie every of your system's availability to the availability of that central cache. By having dis distributed cache, what you, what you get 
um, is much more memory potentially. You don't have to buy these huge instances which uh, which run at 250 gigs of RAM, uh, but rather uh, you can stick with a, a large number of uh, smaller instances, and you don't have that single point of failure. What that means is that you have the you, you need to have the ability to correctly shard your your workload. Uh, Another piece of advice uh, would be to try and really make a list of uh, what data st uh, storage layer you use for what purpose on your infrastructure to avoid having you know, everyone, every other uh, database on the market uh, ending up in your infrastructure. Um, if you choose a SQL server, uh, choosing one in most, casing in most cases should be sufficient uh, there are always uh, battles between PostgreSQL and MySQL. Uh, in the end, uh, whichever choice you make will probably be the right one because the properties are quite similar. Um, you should probably only have one caching solution, uh, one queuing system, uh, and, and maybe you choose a, an eventually consistent store such as uh, Cassandra or HBase, but there again, choosing only one uh, will make things much easier and documenting which system you choose to store what type of information uh, will make things easier for your team altogether. Um, using service registries um, is way more important for cloud native applications than uh, uh, it is for traditional uh, solutions. Um, the fact that you can have nodes that come up and go um, basically forfeits the, the approach of manually uh, configuring uh, how systems inter interconnect together. Uh, service registries will help uh, in that case. Uh, load balancers also can be used as uh, good interaction points. You already have a service registry, most likely, which is DNS. Uh, it's great to start with. Uh, and actually, the, the default service registry, even in container orchestrators now, um, Going a bit further, uh, solutions such as Zookeeper and etcd can really help uh, because in addition to uh, consistent uh, service registries, they also bring uh, a number of additional features such as distributed locks, barriers, uh, and um, coordination mechanisms for your applications. Right. I'll go very quickly here since uh, uh, it's a more developer-oriented um, conference, but as much as possible, try to avoid human interventions on your machines. Uh, when you have configuration drift, uh, new software of, uh, or configuration file changes, reprovisioning infrastructure ends up being way easier. Uh, and containers actually help greatly in that regard. Uh, and as much as possible, thinking about uh, systems as part of clusters and not as individual snowflakes uh, the whole cattle versus pet uh, approach would definitely be something I would favor. All right, very quickly before I run out of time, um, we, we are now at the point where there is a new layer of abstraction that's available uh, to us, uh, which are container orchestra orchestrators. They help free you of alloc allocation decisions that you would have to make yourself, uh, yourself in more standard um, architectures, which is a great win. You don't need to think about where should I put this specific type of software. Uh, the, the cluster decides for you. Uh, and I think uh, that in, in that world of container orchestrators, uh, all the advice um, I gave you will make even more sense. You're sort of pushed into this new way of thinking when you build applications for Docker and for orchestration. Um, and if we look at what's ahead of us, I think one of the things, the, the key things that's starting to happen is now we're seeing more and more software that actually realizes uh, infrastructure operation. We're, we're seeing databases and monitoring solutions that are built specifically for orchestrators uh, to free you of having to think about these properties. And that's all I have. I'll just mention very quickly that uh, we're always looking for uh, people to, to join the team as well. So uh, if you want to talk about that, come see me at Exoscale's booth. Uh, and that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, welcome. All right. I want to get straight to the meat of this. Why should we choose your company over AWS or Azure or Google Cloud? 
Well, I, I think it's you a great question. To know. It's a great question. Um, we, we started with the idea that, we, with the strong belief, uh, my co-founder and I, that uh, everyone, even application builders, should have uh, the, the ability to run unsupervised by the US. That was one of our you know, uh, strong initial ideas. Um, that uh, things should be simple uh, in terms of understanding how pricing work, uh, but also in understanding uh, how these complex infrastructure um, uh, concepts worked, uh, and that it should be more palatable than uh, than it could be on AWS. Um, that's we did a, a lot of work on UX and on the API to make it as simple to consume as possible, and we also put a lot of attention on support. Okay, and the follow-up question there is, if you weren't allowed to use Exascale, which cloud provider would you use? Uh, that's, um, well, I'm, if, if you look at my self-description, uh, uh, the fact that I'm a Yakshava, I would probably start building it again, so I'm, but I'm a very bad uh, user in that sense. Uh, if today I was forced to choose something, I would most likely go to uh, um, a Kubernetes offering directly, um, maybe on DigitalOcean and built from there. Okay, Kubernetes on something. Yes. Kubernetes on something as a service. So, uh, very technical. How is vertical downscale implemented? Do you have to restart the instance or can it happen on the fly? Um, from the service perspective, a, uh, a stop of the instance is needed, mostly because uh, OSs in general deal very badly with um, um, vertical scaling operations. Like if you add or remove RAM from a system, th there are no OSs that you know, correctly know how to handle this. Okay. Um, which is so why we chose the, the, the action of forcing you into stopping the machine and restarting okay. Start, it. Start, stop. Yeah. Good. Um, Ooh, the score has changed by the second here. Um, do you have an opinion about Golang? Uh, yes, I do. We, we use it. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, how would I say? Do you I, I think I'm a bit difficult, uh, and so that, that is not our language of uh, choice. But we do, uh, we do use it for uh, small, our small TCP servers and, and a little bit of systems programming. OK. Um, it is 6.15. If everybody wants to take a couple more minutes, we can take a couple more questions. You look very patient, so. Uh, um, wow, and this changes every time I look at it. Could you stop? For, no. Uh, what are your experience with upscaling and outscaling databases with a lot of write operations? Do you have any exosale solutions for that? Um, so. We use Cassandra extensively for, for that approach. And there aren't a lot of systems that will give you consistent write guarantees uh, over time. And I think uh, Cassandra today is one of the, the few that uh, keeps interesting uh, properties as you scale out. Uh, what that means, though, I mean, from my perspective today, there are no solutions that uh, give you uh, consistency uh, across a large amount of write. So you have to do away with consistency and choose eventual consistency in that case and build your application to support that model. All right, last question. How do you sell, how do you sell using queues to a team or, or dev manager who've always used RPC? Uh, if, <laughs> that's, that, that's also an interesting question. Uh, I think that uh, decoupling approach and that key I think the fact that you can build a key KPI that says, this is where I should scale, uh, and this is what I should bail, base my auto-scaling upon, so we're going we're gonna to be as cost-efficient as possible, would be an approach for a, a dev manager. Um, I also think that it's uh, now a little bit easier. Uh, there are a lot of things happening around the Apache Kafka world, which uh, makes Apache Kafka uh, quite prevalent into, in, in most uh, IT organizations now. So they're basically saying, it's already there for the data lake project. Why not use it, why not use it for uh, uh, our queuing system would also be an approach. All right, Pierre-Yves, thank you so much. Thank you. If you have more questions. <laughs> <laughs>